scripture reading is from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is God's word. And everyone said amen at the reading of God's word. Well, we're continuing in our series through First and Second uh, Peter. We're in Second Peter. Uh, we began it last week. I'm in that same set of verses there. Um, got a few more things to say before we move on. Um, but this morning, we're going to look at this idea, uh, and, and we are a gospel-centered church, if you haven't figured that out. Every week we talk about that, and that's what we're supposed to do, and that's what we do. Um, but as you look at this passage, Peter is, I think he's dealing with, obviously he's dealing with the context, he's dealing with people that he's talking to, but I think he's also revealing something in himself to us. When you look at Scripture, Peter I think he had certain insecurities about certain things in his life. Um, whatever there wasn't somebody saying something, he was saying it. Um, and, and you see in Galatians, and we'll look at it later, where um, certain people came from Jerusalem who were uh, of Jewish descent. Uh, prior to them showing up, Peter was hanging out with Gentiles. But when they showed up, he wouldn't hang out with Gentiles anymore. And it says that, Paul went and withstood him to the face, which basically Paul got in his face. Paul got in his grill and told Peter, you're being a hypocrite. And he says something really interesting because basically Peter is being to a large degree racist. And Paul doesn't address it by saying racism is bad, which we know it is bad. He says it's not in line with the gospel. Therefore, it is bad. And it seems like Peter has in some issues in his life where there may be some insecurities. And we'll look at that a little bit more here. But what this passage starts out at by telling us is he says, basically, the gospel is about whose you are, not who you are. It's about whose you are, not who you are. Because what he says here, it's, it's really interesting. He says, servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he uses both names, Simon Peter. He uses his Jewish name and his Greek name. He uses his birth name and his rebirth name. Because he's talking to two different people here. He's talking to those who were of the Jewish nation, of people who are ethnic, uh, ethnically Jewish, who become Christian. And he's talking to people who are Gentiles, who became Christians, and he says to them, really interesting, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. Why does he say that? Because there were people who didn't think they were of equal standing with them. So he's doing a polemic. He's doing a, a situation where he's dealing with an issue. And he says he's dealing with those who have obtained their faith 
And that faith that they've obtained is of equal standing to those who were born Jewish. And he says they got the faith by the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ um, and Savior Jesus Christ. And Peter is saying, listen, it's more important whose you are than who you are. Because every world has a pecking order. Everyone seeks, because of the insecurities we have, to put forth ourselves as better than others. And when you deal with insecure, insecure people like Peter, they're people who are always talking. They're never listening. Or listening is very hard for them. And when they're listening to, them, to you, you could see them trying to think of an answer that's better than yours. And they're usually always giving you their resume. You don't even have to ask for it. And what they're basically telling you is how much better they are than you. And by the way, they always tell and remind you when they're in charge that they're in charge. By the way, if you need to tell people that you're in charge, you're just proving to yourself that you're not in charge. But there's a pecking order in the world. There is. And we all want to say who we are. And who we are is more important. And Peter is saying no. In this faith, in the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter who you are. It matters whose you are. Every, in our world today, there is a pecking order. Now, you know, we have this, well, we had it. We've shifted over some of our um, social um, gospel kind of things here in um in in the in in our, our community and we started out about 15 years ago with this backpack program that we started in the west genesee school district and we went over to a school that was right across the street from the campus that we had in camillus and i spoke to this wonderful person who sent me to another incredible person and it was a lady there and she was the school like counselor and she's just this terrific lady and she's like we need this she says we have kids who are hungry and um, I'm like, great. So we started a backpack program. I think we had 20 packs we'd bring over there every week. And I'd bring them to her, and she was terrific. She was always really nice. It was always, it's always nice when you walk into a place and everybody's glad to see you. You know, hey, it's the guy with the food. And I'd walk in there, and I was like, yeah, you know, sign an autograph. But it's, she was wonderful. She, the lady was wonderful. And um, she told me I have to take a leave of absence. I'm like, what's going on? She got breast cancer, and she's fine. She's cancer free. Um, she's like, I, I got to step away for a number of months and they're going to have a replacement for it for me and she'll be here next week. So, okay, great. And this was a wonderful person. And, um, her replacement wasn't that wonderful. And I walked in and she was just very different. And, um, she was, you know, I don't know if I, uh, I don't want to insult her and my old, my insults are not correct anymore. But anyway, uh, she was very well groomed, um, presented herself in a certain way, and she was very put off by the backpack program. And I, in talking with her, she says, I'm going to be honest with you, I just don't have time for this. And I was like, you don't have time to feed hungry children? She says, no, I don't mean it like that. I sure meant it like that. But she said, I'm from Manlius. I was like, so you got a half an hour commute. What's she says? We don't have that. This we don't have this problem there. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but you do. You just don't know it. Statistically, you do. It might not be as much, but you do. And she's like, well, and and I could feel my old nature. My, my adrenaline starting to go up a little bit. And she said, I'm from New Jersey. And we don't have that kind of poverty there. I said, where are you from in New Jersey? She said, northern New Jersey. I said, whereabouts in northern New Jersey? She said, Bergen County. I said, I grew up in Bergen County. And you ever see someone when their blood kind of leaves their face? 
I happen to grow up in a really nice little community. I did. I said, what town? She goes, why? I said, I grew up in Irving County. She said, uh, Teaneck. I said, oh, I used to work for a ministry associated with Ann Page in Teaneck. Same kind of ministry that we're doing here. And God was like, you know what? I kind of delivered this rebuttal to you on a silver platter. Don't kick it across the room. So I did. So I said, I grew up in Hillsdale. So every time I would go into the school, I would say, how's it going? Hey, have you been to Teaneck? Because <laughs> there's a pecking order. And we all have those kind of things. And in the kingdom of God, Peter is telling us here, they don't mean anything. It doesn't matter who you are. It matters whose you are. Do you belong to Christ? And when you do that, that's the most important thing. In her world, it mattered who she was. In the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter. In the world, it matters whether or not you're from Manlius or Camillus. It matters whether you're from Teaneck or Hillsdale. It matters whether you're from New Jersey or Timbuktu. It matters. It does not matter in the kingdom of God. And what Peter is saying here is remember, it doesn't matter who you are. It matters whose you are, that you belong to the king. And in our society today, this is so hard for us. We are taught to be so individualistic. We are taught that it really matters. And it doesn't add up to a hill of beans in the kingdom of God. And Peter is saying that whether you are born a Jew, or whether you were born a Greek, whether you were a, a, a Pharisee of Second, Temp Second Temple Judaism, or you are a pagan, it doesn't matter. What matters is you receive the righteousness and you have faith in the God who saves you, Jesus Christ. Now, I know we all think when we get to heaven... It doesn't matter what country you're going to be because we're all going to be Americans anyway. That's not true. You know what? Every other religion, that matters. If you look at Hinduism, Judaism, um, Judaism Buddhism, Mohammedism, they are all located virtually where they started. Yes, they spread out. They have moved around the country. But by and large, the bulk of them huh, is right back where they started. Christianity is the exact opposite. When you see the numbers that are going on in Asia and in South America, it is frightening. They don't have enough pastors. They don't have enough people. They don't, churches are just, people are spilling out all over the place. It just culturally moves wherever God sends it. Because it doesn't matter who you are. It matters whose you are. And Peter is talking about that right here. He's saying, listen, I know this. you think this is super important to you. But in the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter. And by the way, sometimes I think it's a distraction. Sometimes I think it's counterintuitive. And the gospel has this incredible paradox that goes, um, goes along with it. And this idea that in this individualistic society that we have, everybody is consumed in doing what they want to do. And the gospel tells us there's a paradox. The paradox is if you want to have life, 
You need to give it away. If you want to find life, you need to lose it. Happiness, which everybody thinks is the most important thing to ever seek for and find, it is the only thing God tells us if you seek it, you will never find it. I know someone sung a song that you get happiness if, if you have a room that doesn't have a roof. I don't know what that means. But if you seek happiness, you will never find it. But if you seek Christ and you seek God, you will find them and you will find happiness. John 12 says, whosoever loves his life loses it, and whosoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. There's this paradox that we need to embrace. And we need to understand. Part of that comes from, obviously, the Enlightenment, but um, very famous poem, Invictus, by Henley, and he existed late 19th, early 20th century, where he writes, and it's so arrogant, he says, I am the captain of the faith, my faith. I am the master of my soul. And we get this individualism that we live in today from that because we believe that. And the gospel is totally the opposite of that. If you believe that you are the captain of your faith and you are the master of your soul, you are doing something exact opposite to what the ancient world used to do and the writers of our faith did. The, ancient, the people of our ancient faith used to adjust their lives to truth and they used to adjust their lives to a lighthouse that was on the shore. And they said, if I'm going to get safe passage from here to there, I got to adjust myself to that fixed point right there. And I got to make my, I got to adjust my life to that. And Invictus tells us, no, what you need to do is take the lighthouse and put it right on the bow of the boat. So wherever you turn the, 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 the wheel, you're in the right direction. And that's why we have things, we have people telling us to seek your own truth. If you do that, you'll find a lie. Now, I'm not saying that there are some good questions that we need to ask ourselves and we need to do some deep diving inside of our own being. That is really true. But we're not supposed to seek our truth. We're supposed to seek God's truth. People say, you do you. How about you do God? Because that's what he begins to talk about here. He said, it doesn't matter who you are. It matters whose you are. And when you become a child of king, you don't do you. You do God. And it's not about your truth. It's about God's truth. And you are not the captain of your fate. You are not the master of your soul. Jesus Christ is. And he proved it by the butchery he, he suffered for us and by punching a hole into eternity and saying, hey guys, it's over here. I opened up this way for you to follow me. There's a verse that just struck me this week. Actually, my, my wife read it, and, and, and I heard her reading it, and I was like, repeat that. It's 1 Timothy 4, 1. It says, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. That's some crazy stuff. How do we know 
if what we're hearing in our head or what we're hearing in our heart is from us? How do we know that it's true? How do we know that it's not coming from the underworld? How do we know that? If you are the captain of the faith and you're the master of his soul, you're on your own. You're on your own. But if you are a child of the most, Forward in this thing called faith, message in godliness. Next, Peter t- begins to tell us about this idea that the gospel is about where we are going, not where we have been. Which, when you've had a life like mine, I need to remind that of my. I need to remind myself of that every day. It's not about where you've been, but it's about where you're going. And he says, you may become partakers of the divine nature. That we are supposed to be going forward in this faith, and eventually we may be, become partakers of divine nature. Do you know that when we go into eternity, we will become so amazing that if we saw ourselves now, we would probably worship ourselves. That's what transformation is going to happen with us. That what's going to happen to us caused Lucifer to be jealous, so jealous that he forsook God. And we get to go forward and become part of, and begin to experience this idea of divine nature. Now, in the free Methodist tradition or the Methodist tradition, we call this, in part, this idea of divine nature, is we begin this idea of entire sanctification, which basically means is if your spirit is a house, you basically welcome God into your house, and you say every room and closet and locked door is in the basement, crawl space, is totally open to you. And you are invited to come into my house and evict anything that's there that's not of you. In the ancient traditions, they call it the, um, theosis, which is basically this idea and repentance because the ancient faith was trajectory-based. You were going in one direction away from God. Repentance means to turn around and go in a direction towards God. And what happens as we begin to go forward towards God we become to experience God and become more like God. Theosis. Those who do not make that turn are actually going in the other direction. And instead of becoming more godly, they become more diabolical. Because they just keep getting further and further away from God. But the thing here is that it's important 
is this idea that we're moving in a direction, but we've escaped from something. We got away from something. There's an interesting book years ago I, I read called The Onion Field, and it was written by, it was, a, it's a, it was written in the early 70s, but it, I, I think I read it in I think the early 80s, and um, it was a story about two uh, police officers from L.A. who were abducted. And uh, these two fe- people, these two men took these two police officers out into the onion fields. It was written by John Wabach. And um, they took their guns from them, and they surrendered guns. And the, they had these guys out in the middle of nowhere, out in California, and they shot one of the police officers. And one of the police officers turned and ran. And before he knew it, he ran four miles through the onion fields and found a farmhouse and basically called for backup and things like that. But he escaped from danger. And his response to this atrocity and this horrible thing and this incredible evil was, I'm escaping from this. And he ran just four miles. Now, I... I, I get in my shape, I have trouble driving four miles, okay? Running four miles would probably take me a month and you know several knee replacements, but he escaped. And the escape was so violent. He just ran four miles. So many of us don't realize that when we enter into the Christian faith, God's given us an escape. Many of us get get the escape and we just stay right on the outside of it. And Isaiah talks about this. That's what the Israelites did. And what they would respond to God whenever God would get upset me, like, what are you doing? They'd go, oh, the temple of the Lord, temple of the Lord, we're good. And they would kind of like, it was like the temple was home base. They'd be like, oh, we're good. We got this thing here. And God's like, oh, no, you don't. And we think that Christianity, we're just, we're just getting out of it and making our own ways. No, you're escaping from something. God has opened up a trap door for you to get out. And Peter is saying you need to remember. God has enabled you an escape. And it's not about where we've been, but it's about where we're going. What direction are you going in? Have you escaped? Is the door open and you can see it and you don't know if you should go through it? Well, here's some practical things. I mentioned this was a real practical uh, uh, passage uh, last week. Um, here's some practical things. So when we look at this idea, and, and he gives us some guidelines for this theos, uh, th- um, theosis or this entire sanctification thing, but what discipleship or theosis or entire sanctification takes, the first thing is this idea of effort. You see that word effort, it's right in that passage. Some of you are saying, well, I thought I was saved by what Jesus did. And that is totally true. And the quote is, we are saved by faith alone. But faith that saves is never alone. That's Martin Luther. On Wednesday nights, I teach a class on celebration of discipline, which is holy sweat. Now, you can do things when you're a farmer that can produce a greater yield in your crops, or you could do nothing and just hope that the crops grow. You can break up the ground. You can sow seed. You can fertilize it. You can do things to aerate the soil, to make it, or you can just do nothing. 
Christianity is this idea where we are totally saved by faith, but what we do is we respond to that. We make effort in that direction. You all made effort in that direction by coming here to church today and listening to the little troll that stands up here and shares sermons with you. So you can pat yourself on the back today, but effort. So it does involve effort. It does. It doesn't just happen to us. It's not quietism where we just sit there and God does his stuff to us. No, we work in concert with God. Grace is an unmerited favor, but it is also divine enablement. It's God enabling us to do inside of us what we can't do on our own. So it takes effort. It takes time. This is something that is huge. We used to live in a country and in, 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 in a nation that had a standard, under, had, a, had, a, had a group understanding of what morality was. That doesn't exist anymore. Everybody, not, not that everybody obeyed it, but they just knew it. And it's interesting that in our nation's history, um, free Methodism comes out of the Second Great Awakening. Pretty much everybody had an understanding of Christianity. They didn't all go to church. They didn't all obey, but they kind of knew it. It was taught in the public schools. It was part in the. It was in the air. It was in the. You know, it was the zeitgeist of the 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 time. So what that would happen is they would have awakenings, which was kind of like people were asleep, kind of like what you're about to do, and God would come in and shake them up, and they get all fervent about the about Christianity. Well, we don't live in a country that needs an awakening. We, need a, we live in a country that needs a revival. We don't need to wake people up. They need to go from death to life. They need to get resurrected. One of my seminary professors, his son graduated from college. He went to get him, to, went to get him a cross. The girl at the jewelry store said to him, do you want it with the little guy on it without the little guy? True story. He says, little guy? She goes, yeah, some of them got a little guy on them. She had no idea who it was. That was 25 years ago. We don't need an awakening. We need to help people go from death to life. And it takes time. Spiritual growth is compared to growing fruit. That's why they call it the fruit of the Spirit. And it takes time. You can't be rushed. And when you're in a church that has people that have come to Christ and they're growing, you have all kinds of issues and problems and brokenness. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And fruit, you can't watch it grow. You can only measure it. It's measurable, but it's not observable. And yes, we are saved by faith alone, but saving faith doesn't remain alone. So it, 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 it takes effort. It takes action on, on our part. It takes an embracing of, of, of our will to move forward. It takes time. It also takes vulnerability. It's done in the body of Christ. And this is really, really hard for us. As individualist Christians, you hear this all the time as, as Americans. And this is started when I first became a Christian in, in the early 80s. It's like, oh, you could be a Christian and, 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 and never go to church. In the early church, that's crazy. It makes no sense. Because you couldn't declare yourself a Christian. The church declared you a Christian. Do you get it? I can't just wake up, you know, as much as I wanted to when I was seven years old and say, I have a driver's license. No, I had to go take tests. I had to go prove to the state. I had to get of age. I had to prove to the state that I was worthy of that driver's license, which wasn't very hard. And then they gave me a driver's license. But anybody could be a Christian. I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. I'm a Christian. No, the church used to say who's a Christian and who isn't a Christian. So you couldn't just be a Christian by yourself. It didn't make any, that doesn't make any sense to an ancient. You needed to be in community. 
And people needed to rub up against you and they needed to see what was going on. In the early church, when they would have communion, they say, if you're not a member, if you're not Christian, it's time for you to go home. They're like, sorry, we don't want you to hurt yourself. Because we lived inside this idea of a body. And inside that body, there was vulnerability and accountability. Hebrews 3.13 says, Exhort one another daily, unless you will grow hard from the deceitfulness of sin. You might be able to be a Christian by yourself, but at best you're going to be shallow, and most likely you might grow hard through the deceitfulness of sin. It takes that vulnerability. It takes that rubbing up against one another. It takes everyone else's problems to get in your face and annoy you. So you see how you need more patience and things like that. So it takes effort, time, vulnerability. Last, it takes submission. Now, if you were to take an egg corn and go to a block of concrete, say a sidewalk, and you were to say, who's going to win in a fight? The egg corn or the sidewalk? Now you take that egg corn and you begin to smash it against that sidewalk to try to break that sidewalk up. It's going to pulverize and you're going to probably hurt your hand. It's going to pulverize that egg corn. But if you take that egg corn and you plant it under that sidewalk, you've all seen the pictures of it. You give it a lot of time. You let it do its thing it will break that sidewalk up in pieces and an oak tree will come forth. The Holy Spirit working in us is not a magic bullet. It's a magic acorn. And when we do that, it takes us submitting to God. The last one that we need is this idea of submission. Who's in charge? If you're in charge, it's, you're, you're, it's not Christianity. If God is in charge, that's what this faith is about. I heard a missionary from... Um, South America one time say, I need help with teachers because I'm two unanswered prayers away from losing my church. Is that the God that you serve? What happens when God doesn't answer your prayers? By the way, God answers every one of your prayers. He just doesn't answer them in the way you like them. Jesus asked for God to do something, and God was like, nah, no. Jesus asked not to go to that cross, and God said, that's what needs to happen. And he said, okay, not my will, but your will be done. And if you're going to grow in godliness, and you're going to let this idea of entire sanctification or discipleship or theosis grow in you, you need to be willing to like that egg corn, get put in dark places and go through difficulty and go through pain. And it's hard. There's nothing easy about the cross. Our faith, and we have to always be reminded of this, it wasn't founded on crazy people talking about heresy, flying around in private jets and living in multi-billion dollar homes or million dollar homes. It was found in on people who gave up everything to follow their God, not at the cost, not, the, not at, the, not at the, the, the peril of their life, but the very cost of their life. 
And for us to experience theosis, for us to experience entire sanctification, for us to be disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to submit to God, even when it's hard, even when it's painful, even when it's dark. It takes effort, time, vulnerability, and submission. Here's some next steps for this coming week. This week, I'll ask God to forgive me and be Lord of our, my life. If you were listening today and the gospel kind of made sense and clicked. There you go. You could become a Christian. If you want to talk about it, you can pull me aside or Pastor Jess aside, and we'd love to talk to you about it. Or maybe this is you. This week, I'll ask God, help me remember the gospel and help me just understand that what the gospel is about. It's about whose I am, not who I am. It's about where I'm going, not where I've been. Or maybe this is you. This week, I'll ask God, show me how to stay when times get difficult. Maybe you're at your wit's end right now. Maybe you're in a dark place like that corner, and it's just like, I don't know if I can take anymore. There's grace for you. And we'll pray for you right now. That's you. Choose that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your continued mercy and goodness to all of us. Thank you for the gospel and its power. And no, it's difficult and it's counter um, to culture today. Lord, let us be people who are willing to meet you at the cross. Lord, as we chosen one of these next steps this, this week, Lord, meet each and every one of us this week. You know, you lived life. It's not easy. It's painful. It's scary. It's hard. It's humiliating. But with you, we can endure all things. So meet with each and every one of us as we've chosen one of these next steps this week. We pray this in Christ's name. Everyone said?